Thank you. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to speak with you today. As a study of the collected abstracts makes clear, our paper helps to begin a conversation about ideas that will be further elaborated by our colleagues in presentations to come. We would like to acknowledge this interconnected and collaborative aspect of the conference and look forward to continuing the conversation. To frame our discussion, we outline two challenges, one from the perspective of the music scholar and the other from the perspective of the music librarian. One of the inefficiencies of modern musicological research is that each scholar must reassemble or recreate all prior scholarship on a given topic. Making this task more difficult, the way we publish tends to silo our findings with music history, music theory, music librarianship, and the digital humanities, sometimes construed as separate disciplines. While this reassembly work used to be unavoidable, current technological developments offer new opportunities. As we will propose, more information could be built into the catalog for automatic retrieval, specifically certain aspects of interwork relationships, compositional processes, and secondary source materials. Our first example comes from WC. Consider the relationship between his two published settings of Verlaine's poem on Sordine, composed in 1882 and 1892. <laughs> While sounding quite different, the opening motive of the 1892 setting resembles the earlier setting in several features. The pianissimo dynamic, triple meter, syncopation, borrowed triplet subdivision, and an emphasis on G-sharp. In both songs, the ambiguous harmonic oscillations at the start are answered with a final cadence in the major key. The question of kinship between these two settings becomes more urgent near the close of the 1892 setting. Here, Debussy returns to the opening theme only to interrupt it with a prominent quotation from the 1882 setting. In both songs, he uses the same melody to set the poem's final line. I argue that the understanding of this passage as a quotation per se, and not simply as a contrasting interruption, clarifies the song's semiotics. Characterized as a borrowed music, the sense of the passage's alien quality becomes ontologically manifest. And yet, previous scholarship has not articulated this relationship. Barbara Meister describes the, quote, distant effect of the passage in the 1892 setting, but she does not acknowledge it as a quotation. Likely, this is because her study focuses on the later uh, setting only, rather than making a comparison of both settings. More strikingly, although Arthur B. Wank compares the vocal melodies of five settings of On Sordine, including Debussy's two settings, he makes no mention of this specific similarity. In additional separate studies, Marie Rolf and Benedict Lessmann compare the two Debussy settings, and yet, like Wank, they do not mention this connection. So this relationship goes repeatedly unremarked. But Ansordine participates in another quotation that is published in multiple sources. Namely, Debussy quotes the 1892 setting of Ansordine in his 1904 setting of Colloque Sentimental. The connection between these pieces is repeatedly noted in the literature. As we have seen then, the issue of quotation in On Sordine highlights a certain kind of musicological inefficiency. In some instances, in service of our scholarly focus, and perhaps unaware, we fail to remark undescribed work relationships. And at the same time, we reiterate, with or without citation, work relationships that have appeared in print many times in the past. Debussy's on Sourdine settings also raise the problem of the work, of versions and quotations. Although Wenck, 
Rolf and Lessmann must have noticed this similarity between the two settings in the course of their comparative work. None mentions it. Perhaps they omit this information because the similarity distracts from the differences they were focused on describing. Perhaps they didn't realize this relationship had not been previously described. Or they simply consider the information trivial, understanding the first setting as an early draft of the second. Indeed, Rolf calls the two versions completely different, but she also considers them to pertain to a single work. As a music metadata librarian working with manuscripts, I see firsthand the limitations of our cataloging standards and systems. The subtleties of manuscripts and the information they contain cannot be adequately encoded in our catalogs, and therefore fraught work relationships are insufficiently described. In addition to the questions of draft and reuse raised in the WC examples, we also encounter problems in creating metadata for revisions, sketches, and incomplete works, among others. The American opera, The Ballad of Baby Doe, was first performed in Colorado in 1956, and after significant revisions, was given its New York premiere in 1958. The 1958 version is now considered the standard. What is less well known is that in between these two performances, the opera was also performed at Stanford University in 1957. Furthermore, as I discovered when cataloging the conductors and the vocal score, uh, this interim Stanford version contains Columbine, an additional chorus in the opening scene that is found in neither the first nor the final version of the score. So how can we best capture this information in our library catalog? Now, while scholars and librarians understand that operas can be revised as described above, um, there is currently no way to distinguish these versions of Baby Doe in machine actionable library metadata. The LC authority file has a single authority record representing all versions of the opera. Differences between them are described in free text notes. Now, RDA does allow catalogers to distinguish between different versions of a work, but only by creating different access points for each version. These versions are cataloged as if they are independent works. For example, the different versions of Beethoven's Fidelio, uh, these have access points like this in the LC authority file. Now, it may be clear to the human reader who is familiar with the history of Beethoven's works that these access points represent different versions of the opera. But the relationship between these access points is based only on text strings and not explicitly encoded. Which leads this talk further into fraught work relationships. In RDA cataloging, a sketch of a work is distinguished from the actual work by appending the string sketches to the end to the work access point. According to the current RDA standard, sketches are expressions of the work. But sometimes the music in the sketch is not found in the final version, as is the case with this Beethoven sketch. In a letter to Stanford Libraries, musicologist Alan Tyson explained, this is Beethoven's autograph, but it represents the first writing out of the arietta with many alterations. Subsequently, Beethoven must have written out another version for publication, since the published version differs considerably from the Stanford autograph. And what if sketches being cataloged cannot be definitively linked to a single work? I recently cataloged several Mahler sketches that exemplify this challenge. One sketch, possibly dating to 1893, contains material relating to Mahler's Symphony No. 3 and Symphony No. 2. Another sketch, with the caption title, Fastas Kinter Zelt, may have been originally envisioned as the seventh movement of Symphony No. 3, although Mahler's final version of the symphony only has six movements. 
Alternatively, as another scholar asserts, the music contained in this Vastas Kinterzelt sketch may actually be from the second movement of that symphony. On the other hand, the title Vastas Kinterzelt is also closely associated with Mahler's earlier song, Das Himmlische Leben, which he reused as part of uh, Symphony No. 4. So in light of such challenges, both from the perspective of the music scholar and from the perspective of the music librarian, we offered two proposals. First, in order to better define relationships between physical items and their intellectual content, we propose extending the ontology that could articulate in machine actionable metadata the following information. Variant versions, and if known, time place of creation, contingent versus independent drafts or sketches, version or sketch chronology, quotation, borrowing, and reuse, work affiliation without work integration, uh, that is a sketch that doesn't make it into the final version, and a physical belonging, a part of a set or separated from a set. Here's a basic diagram that shows how an ontology could organize the data for versions of a work. Second, capitalizing on the fact that modern scholarly publications and scholars are often assigned URIs, we propose embedding citation-like metadata that would collocate pertinent sources. In other words, we suggest embedding a bibliography into the metadata. For instance, the RISM metadata for the Mahler sketches could contain linked citations to the articles that discuss the sketches. Because of RISM's special focus, the catalog could become one of the first uh, music research tools to weave together primary and secondary source materials in machine actionable metadata. One could even imagine detailed metadata in which scholarship on the work or item could be characterized in terms of intellectual provenance and certainty. For example, here is a diagram that shows that certain sketches contain material related to two separate works. In addition to the named graphs, oops, in addition to the named graphs in this example can express the sources of the relational knowledge. In summary, linked data technologies offer significant opportunity for reimagining and redefining the scope of catalog functionality. We could enhance our incorporation of work level data in two ways. First, by expanding the traditional catalog model to include granular descriptive metadata that better suits manuscript and other materials that contain fraught work relationships. And second, by weaving secondary sources directly into the data. With RISM's interest in incorporating uh, work-level metadata and recent developments in linked data, one can see the possibilities for advancing historical musicology by truly 21st century means. Thank you.